Today, I get to welcome into the warm glow of the zoologist's campfire, a medical entomologist and public health biologist called Marietta Brax. She's a researcher at the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment, the RIVM in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. She has many, many scientific papers that are mostly on insects as disease vectors. And they range from what type of sweat mosquitoes like the, the most, uh, how mosquitoes can take a plane to get somewhere, and how to map mosquitoes and other disease-carrying arthropods uh, in something called VectorNet. She's written books about the subject as well, I think about Lyme and about mosquitoes. And she did her PhD at Wageningen University uh, in exactly the same years that I did my master's there, but we never met. <laughs> so she is here uh, today because of her fantastic stories, but also to defend the honor of mosquito chasers worldwide after the throwaway comment last week by Ruhl Wouters that mosquito field work might not be that all that exciting. Well, let's uh, prove Ruhl wrong today. Marietta, welcome. I take up the challenge. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, um, just to respond to that, uh, snake chasers, they get all the glory, but you actually chase the most dangerous creatures on earth by body count, at least. Isn't, isn't that right? That's the popular uh, saying, but actually entomologists always say it's not the mosquito that is to blame, but it's the virus that it uh, transmits. So actually, we are uh, really uh, very often very willing to uh, not take that credit, okay. uh, although a lot of people want to be the most dangerous and stuff like that. But for whatever reason, we get that name very often, and it's more often that uh, medical entomologists, uh, at least uh, that I'm a favor of, are in the business of... Um, not raising the crisis, but to calm people down because a lot of things are much more credited to insects. Mm. So I would like to uh, give a little bit the floor to to the nice field work and definitely exciting, maybe as exciting as uh, snake uh, investigations and field work, but um, also to uh, to uh, enlighten a little bit on the on the fantastic work of uh, uh, world of. Uh, insects and uh, they're not only uh, nasty critters. As, uh, oh, some no, people no, no. I'd, be, I'd be the last to say that I love insects, uh, actually. If you could see around my room here, I have lots of living bugs. Um, and I think you're one of those people who are really going for one type of, of animal. How did you how did you get into biology? How did you get into chasing mosquitoes in the first place? Well, I, I got this invitation last week and I was thinking, um, strangely enough, a lot of people will not uh, see my see me as a field biologist. I'm not a typical field biologist. And I was uh, looking into why that is, because uh, recently I do a lot of uh, field biology and I did it a little bit throughout my career of 25, 30 years. But I think it started with my dad and it happens to be his birthday or it should be his birthday. He right. would have been 87 this mm -hmm. year, uh, today, but he already passed away in 87. By chance, that is uh, the similar date. And I was 17, so way too early. He was 50, but mm -hmm. he was a farmer. He's a big farmer, and uh, I'm a I'm a daughter of him, and together with my two brothers and two sisters, so a big family. And uh, we all are into biology. Uh, oh. So my brother took over the farm. My other brother was doing veterinary science. And my older sister is a biologist. And my other sister is a molecular biologist uh, oh, by wow. training. <laughs> so um, the bug has been put there very early in life. And I think when I, uh, so my dad took us, uh, uh, we lived in the countryside and it was not an ecological science or a biology view to it, but it was just surrounding us. So I um, lived in the countryside. We would go uh, um, on Sundays, probably to uh, have the wild kids out of the house. Uh, my dad took us for uh, a walk just in the fields. There was nothing, no mountains, no nothing, a little bit of forest. And then we would pick flowers and we would, she would know the Dutch uh, flowers by the Dutch name. And then we looked in the booklet, but that was my memory since I'm five till 15 or something. And uh, mm -hmm. we did that a few times a year, probably. Uh, we would uh, go to the forest nearby because my grandma uh, lived there. And I think when I went to the city to study, that was more to do city stuff. So oh. I left the fields mm -hmm. away. As, uh, um, so I was uh, not so used to go to museum and doing history and all kinds of things. And so when I went to 
go to college. I was much more interested in, I, I studied biology, mm -hmm. but not to do field work, but to do molecular stuff or do uh, my, my whole masters is in sensory ecology. So it's more into uh, neurology, but from okay. the animal point of view. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated uh, by the senses that animals had and that humans didn't have. Uh, I started my first year in human nutrition and then I found out that I, uh, I, uh, I didn't really was interested in humans at all. And I was much more interested in animals, not so much in plants my whole life. Plants is only now arriving. But, um, well, judging from your background, you, you've gotten a little bit yeah. of love for plants as well. Yeah. But everything <laughs> comes a little bit in the slipstream. It's not, I'm uh, definitely not, um, a taxonomist. Mm, no. So I, I, I don't know things by name, but I appreciate the nature <laughs> by itself. Um, so it's a little bit uh, from that background that I thought when I went to study that I was already from the countryside. So I thought scouting as such was a little bit for urban kids and not from people from field. So, so mm -hmm. I never considered my real biologist, never did field work, but much more something that is there always like a normal right. thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah. now later in life, I appreciate it so much more that I found when I go into the field that I re connect with actually the normal that I really, really appreciate. So oh, I built it yeah. in and uh, I got away from the policy making and I'm actually now uh, much more involved in arranging field work also in the Netherlands and in the Caribbean. And so it's so um, that's the main places you go to for field work at the Netherlands and the Caribbean or uh... at this moment. Yes, mm. uh, this uh, since uh, 2017, I have a project called Mobocom. And that is uh, short for capacity building for uh, mosquito-borne disease control through sustainable um, uh, mosquito management. Okay. And mm -hmm. that is uh, the Dutch, uh, uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands have uh, six overseas uh, yeah. territories in the Caribbean, which three are uh, their own countries and three are uh, special um, um, communities uh, within the kingdom. And I imagine the field work there is uh, quite nice. I mean, definitely, it's a holiday definitely. destination. <laughs> yeah, but the interesting part is, is that um, um, I like that much. It, we do it together with public health. That means it's very much connected to public health issues. And it's not so much that we go alone in the fields, uh, not to comment on, but there's a lot of work in the, in, in the tropics where uh, Western people go there go into the field, mm -hmm. have maybe two field assistants and then take their data back. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of um, um, connection mm -hmm. with the local people. This is together with the local uh, uh, vector control and the public health department. And uh, I work predominantly on the yellow fever mosquitoes there. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's an urban mosquito. So you come to people's homes. So my field okay. work is actually... In the Caribbean, when we are doing uh, Egypti work together with the vector control unit, is to visit people at home. Mm. What is very interesting. So you're very involved in the culture, and you have to adapt and and see how it goes. And it's that's a wonderful way of uh, uh, doing field work, I think, because I depend on uh, local teams, mm -hmm. and they invite me to go with them. But I go with them. And uh, so you're very ingrained in the culture. And that's very similar to what we did for field work when we were doing my work for a postdoc in Florida. We went to um, Brazil. So a lot of this mm. Asian Egypt work has been done in urban field work. Oh, well, that's field work too. And, I, and as I, you said, you go into people's houses. I imagine you really get to know a country if you get that intimate with exactly. how people live, right? Yeah, yeah, they can uh, also not open the door. So yeah, uh, do, you, do you, you knock on the door and you say, uh, "I want to catch your mosquitoes," or uh, what? What happens? <laughs> it depends a little bit on the on the project. So um, after I did what what you mentioned, did my uh, PhD in marketing, I went to the United States and I was in Florida for mm -hmm. a while. And for Florida, uh, I was doing a project together with Brazil because I was working on invasion biology from the yellow fuji mosquito and the tiger mosquito mm -hmm. it's an item that is a theme if you stay long in the in the in the topic everything comes back again it's a theme very uh current in mm -hmm. europe because 
ancient Egypt I, is encroaching on the European continent too. But yeah. at that time, it just arrived in, in uh, Florida, but also in Brazil. So we mm. were doing an investigation how the um, uh, aedes aegypti and the tiger mosquito would meet and who would be the best competitor. And we found out that that is very context dependent. So it's different whether you are in an urban or very slum area or you're in the forest. And it was actually, oh. uh, we did this project in two cities in Florida, mm-hmm. West Palm Beach and uh, uh, two sites in, uh, in West Palm Beach and in Rio de Janeiro. And we had the transect going from uh, favela, so from the slums yeah. to the forest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Florida doesn't have a real slum area, not a real forest area. We only did the tree in between that will be, that will say that it's rural, suburbia, and urban. Yeah. And so just for context, a transact is a line you draw on a map that you want to pretty much sample all across that line, right? Yeah. We, yeah, we, yeah. we actually had only uh, five points. So it's not oh. exactly like that. But in, in, in Brazil, we had five points. In two different cities, and the uh, five points was from uh, slum area, suburbia, urban, uh, rural, and uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. So forest, rural, suburbia, urban, slum area. Wow. Okay. And, and then you go and knock on doors and say, hey. Yeah. So you cannot do that as a, a Dutch <laughs> citizen working in Florida and go in the favelas of uh, Rio de Janeiro and mm. think that will go fine. No. So we go that with the local <laughs> team and that was great. Mm. So yeah, it is uh, uh, actually one time talking about uh, not very um, campfire like, but very exciting uh we had this of course planned in rio de janeiro with my uh local uh scientists and some a team and the local vector control team and we put um ov traps in people's home that's what our mm. investigation was so you need that close to um um the home and in this case we would put traps there and then we collect them the next week and right. you need approval obviously and uh uh, at one time, we could not come because there was a riot and the police uh, effort oh. in the Rosinha. Mm. Rosinha is one of the biggest favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then we went the next day. <laughs> <laughs> like oh. nothing happened. And it's such a integrate thing of a society there that the next day you can come there and all the fear is gone. And you are mm. there with people and they know where to go. So it was actually... You don't have to decide. You just tangle along, and but then you see uh, people's home. You know how they uh, live. Uh, your my Portuguese is not so good that you can have a long conversations. I could only mm. talk mosquitoes. I can. <laughs> I have a pretty good vocabulary for uh, mosquito Portuguese. I see. <laughs> not, not so much for other things. And then you don't ask too many questions, and mm. people open the door for you, and you see in the house, and you try to be as calm and nice uh, as you can be and do your work. And then you see, obviously, especially when this transect is from the favela yeah. to the urban area, that is quite a stretch of society. Mm. And um, I think that's what I found that I like. I like science, but I, I, as a real scientist, I don't really care too much of what the question is. Any question mm. is interesting, mm-hmm. but I like the work. I see. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that, I think, holds for a lot of uh, things. And maybe uh, that's why I'm not so much an academic anymore. I'm well, uh, I'm a scientist, but I'm not in academia anymore. Right. Well, no, and doing and doing very useful uh, useful work. So did you ever get any strange responses from people when you go in there and, and, and say, oh, I want to put this thing here so the mosquito can lay their eggs? Or uh... Well, interestingly, <laughs> I did it is that uh, I was in, we did this also in Florida and we were in West Palm Beach and in West Palm Beach, it was about two days after the 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 scare of the toxins that was uh, the anthrax uh, scare oh. in uh, Florida. Right. And of course, that's not a very good uh, point to knock on people's door and put something outside their door. So there was a <laughs> lot of fear uh, that they, uh, uh, so we got rejected. Mm. And I was doing it together with my Brazilian colleague. So you can imagine that you're in West Palm Beach with two ladies mm-hmm. who speak funky English, <laughs> putting a pot outside when there was a scare that there was an interesting attack. So that was an interesting yeah. time. And then that is what with fieldwork and urban areas, then people would say, uh, 
don't enter. Mm-hmm. And um, and we always found out that suburbia is the worst to work at. Really? Oh, urban areas, it's it's nice. People are welcoming, especially slum areas. They're super happy. Uh-huh. Rural areas also. Suburbia, they like to keep the door closed for air conditioning, air come out, strange uh-huh. people coming in. So we would get water through the door and then never invited in. It's interesting. Huh. Okay. Well, <laughs> and is that the same in Brazil as in Florida? Yeah, I think there's of course a little bit of difference in uh, that uh, that uh, there's a little bit more uh, human interaction. And, uh, uh, it's a little bit of warm South uh, American uh, attitude. So mm. in general, Brazil is a little bit more exciting to work in than in suburbia, Florida. Yeah, a lot more riots, I imagine, at least back in no, the day. No, 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 but also welcoming <laughs> uh, uh, people interested in what you do. And oh. uh, so, um, but also in uh, in Florida, we had, um, um, for example, in Florida, we came one time in the in the, suburb, uh, the urban slum area. It was a neighborhood in West Palm Beach, and we entered there, and I see that one of the guys have a ankle band. Oh, <laughs> and my Brazilian colleague says, like, oh, that's very fashionable. What is that? And I'm like, well, it's a tracker, this guy. So I had to uh, uh, tell her that. I'm never afraid for that. But, of course, nothing is going to happen there. But that's mm-hmm. something you run into in – it's not a very campfire kind of story, but uh, that happens all the time. So if you visit 15 houses a day – Behind every house, there's a new story. So, um, yeah, wow. that's very interesting. Oh, you must have met a lot, a lot of people. Well, before we get into the, the campfire stories, as you say, I have to ask, because I don't speak to many mosquito experts. Mm-hmm. And so, as one of the greatest mosquito experts, what do you do to be uh, to avoid getting stung by mosquitoes? I've heard stories, people eating a lot of garlic, people... I, you know, spraying all sorts of things on themselves, uh, washing, not washing. What's the trick? First of all, they don't sting. Eh? They bite just sure. for uh, for a little, uh, since you asked me. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we say. Um, I think one of the reasons I'm still in mosquito science is because mosquitoes don't bug me that much. So oh. I don't get big bites. Um, during my PhD, I have... Uh, I wanted to be tough and I fed my own mosquito um, colony mm-hmm. one time because our lab personnel did that and you want to be blood brothers with your personnel so I thought I will do it myself so, so, so hold, hold on, feeding means giving your own blood, right? by the arm okay, so you stick your arm into a cage full yeah. of mosquitoes okay and, uh, <laughs> we did uh, in, in Wageningen University we did olfaction we studied olfaction by mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. So you can also blood feed um, mosquitoes um, in, uh, with with, um, uh, with man brains and stuff like that. But of mm-hmm. course, there's a little bit a uh, bottleneck in which of the mosquitoes can do that or not. Well, if you feed them the normal way, mm-hmm. there's no selection in whether they can find you or if they can pierce through a um, membrane. So uh, the Wagner University feeds all their... Um, uh, breeding, they breed mosquitoes by uh, feeding them on uh, human blood, unless they do virus uh, experiments. At least mm-hmm. that was in the time that I was uh, studying there, uh, between ninety five and ninety nine. Uh, I did it once, and then the next day I had no problem. But the day after, there were like thirty mosquito bites, and that became one big heart. Oh. So I was a little bit too too enthusiastic about it, but it <laughs> might be possible that I did something with my uh, system because after that my body doesn't even make bumps or even doesn't uh really? itch anything yeah so so i don't do anything so that's the trick then to get stung a lot and then after that hopefully your body is bitten a lot ah uh, bitten a lot well they they do inject something so <laughs> what we say in dutch um it, it rhymes in Dutch, but not in English, is that you uh, sting with your butt and you bite with your mouth. Mm, mm, sure. And that's sure. the difference. So yeah, sure. it is, uh, yeah. It's not what comes out, but it's actually what you take in. And when you sting, you usually don't take anything. Uh, no, that's right. That's right. So it's feeding. I anyway, see. 
that's the that's the that's different we um we did it in florida again and i did an experiment what the difference uh, between chicken blood and human blood is for the uh, progeny of uh, aedes aegypti and uh, mm-hmm. aedes albopictus the yellow fever mosquito and the tiger mosquito and um and i did it a little bit more uh, controlled so i had like um uh, mosquitoes in a small uh, tube and i would feed them mm-hmm. and i would count how often they fed and how many eggs they laid and if there is at the end at the lifetime whether they die early or not so I've and, done and that again before. this is feeding with your own blood or i put my arm on the tube where okay. there's mesh and they, okay. they bite yeah. yeah not for the faint of heart all right <laughs> <laughs> well i had one of my students uh, breeding head lice on her arm for about two months really yeah how do you do that uh do you have uh, to walk around with a box all the time or yeah. really no another box we made it under a uh, bandage where uh i put a little f- um arena from blotting paper just like a yeah. a thick piece of paper i put an arena yeah and then i put it on so it was not a box and then uh, with a tuft of hair mm-hmm. and then uh, we had uh, one two three four five six uh lies in there <laughs> I always tell my students that uh, to know something about your animal, you have to spend some time with your animal. Absolutely. And uh, um, I think that's for anything. But uh, mm-hmm. with, of course, uh, blood feeding insects, they're notoriously hard to uh, breed on something else because they need, uh, I mean, you can feed them sugar, but they have to reproduce. And yeah. the point why they are blood feeding is because they use, obviously, the protein to make eggs. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they need it. Yes. So it's very hard to have a colony and no blood feeding for blood feeding insects. So there's yes, always an I issue. Imagine. And uh, very often these vectors are very host specific. So mm-hmm. they like you, like yeah. head lice. You cannot put it on a rabbit. No, I see. <laughs> so you have to walk around. And uh, it is Egypt. I doesn't feed on chicken either, preferentially. Uh, okay. So you really have to. Use humans, I guess. As, as I, I was keeping um, uh, land leeches for fun. Uh, yes. And and they didn't want to feed on me for some reason. I don't know why. And so I, I fed them um, goat's blood that I got from a, uh, a befriended vet. Yeah. But it contained heparin and they all died. Uh, <laughs> blood feeding is, you can that imagine that the yeah. digestion is... Um, uh, preference is just a co-evaluation. They co-evolve together. So mm-hmm. you cannot be good in everything. So you are specialized. So uh, this was the experiment also about because the yellow fever mosquito prefers humans above anything. And the tiger okay. mosquito is a little bit considered um, a zoophil, meaning that it also beats, uh, bites other uh, mm-hmm. mammals than only uh, humans. And uh, those are, of course, a different cow blood and human blood is not the same. Mm. And the enzymes to digest it is uh, not as a, as efficient than for your preferred host. So you can imagine that your progeny is um, uh, the amount of uh, eggs you can lay or the quality of eggs is different, which blood you take. Very often they can, but it's mm-hmm. not as efficient. So, and yeah. If they're hungry, they will take something less tasty than uh, what they really like. Well, right. some don't. Some oh. don't, will refuse. So oh. the specialist, uh, the 3,500 plus uh, species of mosquitoes in the world. So they have their own thing. Mm-hmm. So the, the, some will eat anything. Some are very specific. Some probably can't. Uh, but there's a difference. Yeah. Ah. that's. <laughs> I can just imagine. So... Uh, these technicians that you mentioned in the lab, so they feed the mosquitoes every week or so by putting their arm in there? Yeah, we had, uh, uh, I think that was the schedule, maybe twice a week, and it was 100. Oh, so that's dedication. We really <laughs> appreciated them. Yes. Ah, wow. I can not imagine, but I imagine they don't get any more bumps, right? They, they, their body... No, 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 their body is... is, yeah. uh, is uh, it's, uh, some people... Obviously can't. So uh, you will not do that when you will uh, have like this big histamine outbreak uh, um, the whole time. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's 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 amazing. So that's what we do. Dedication for science, right? Definitely. <laughs> Does ever, ever anything ever gone wrong in the lab, like escapes or or? 
Well, these were non-infected. Uh, when I was working there, we we didn't. Uh, we were much more interested in the insects themselves because it was olfaction. We didn't do infected uh, mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. Now uh, I I left there in '99, so now they have whole basil three lab uh, where they do uh, infection experiments, and then then it's uh, important that they don't escape. Yes. Um, uh, usually the mosquitoes we worked on are tropical mosquitoes. We try not let uh, let them escape, but uh, they are uh, not going to survive. In Florida, both the tiger mosquito and the yellow fever mosquito were present. Mm-hmm. And so it's also not so important that you just uh, worked with uh, a local mosquito species. So it becomes very important when it's an invasive mosquito that is not there or it's an infected uh, mosquito. You definitely should not want to lose them. No. But it's not like when you're in the lab or in the cafeteria near the lab, you're suddenly attacked by some exotic mosquitoes. Oh, I will not guarantee that uh, <laughs> that there might be more mosquitoes uh, at the entomology lab. But it's not the intention. <laughs> so you keep them uh, in uh, in the cage and uh, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they're, they're fine. Well, you know, thinking about my lab, uh, we've had a few scorpion breakouts here and there. Uh, and they're a lot bigger. So I imagine flying things that are really small like that. Uh, it will be yeah you don't you don't become very <laughs> popular so um you mentioned before we start recording uh, whether we um can find someone or trap someone in the mosquito cage uh, actually when we were in florida mm-hmm. we were with four ladies from europe and we were just starting our early 30s but uh, we were 30 year old and uh, florida at that time it was before 9 11 there mm-hmm. were a lot of uh, flight schools there Sure. And yeah. the flight schools are generally inhabited by uh, 21 year old guys who are sent there by their parents to have a career. Mm-hmm. After 9 11, that whole plummeted. But at the time that I was there in 2000, that was all up and running. And yeah. so we, I, this was two Belgian ladies, one, two students from Belgium, me and an um, English lady who was working there. Um, we're surrounded with these young guys because that's the only because Florida is known for being a retired state, except yes. when you have a field station. So we were about the only 30 year old ladies from abroad okay. and then 200 pilots. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sabine was, uh, I was not hanging too much with pilots, but Sabine, my colleague was, and uh, at the moment they had the practical jokes that at some point she had this huge velvet box and she gave it to someone and we just put hundreds of mosquitoes in there and so he opened the box of thinking he had a present <laughs> and that his whole house was full with hungry female <laughs> mosquitoes oh. so if you it's a very good they were bugging her for a long time for just having practical pranks <laughs> i can imagine back. yeah <laughs> anybody so, will want to do I, I think everybody can imagine somebody they would want to send a box like that. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, you cannot get them back in the box. So, he no. probably was really bugged with that for considerable time. <laughs> how how long would it, would they survive if you uh, if a hungry mosquito in your house? How long do they live? Oh, in general, these mosquitoes they probably on average uh, live three weeks. Oh, okay, that's a, that's a that's a but terribly if they, long uh, time. Feed on you. Then yeah. you have your surrounding invested with newborn mosquitoes too, because they take anything. They love it around your house. So um, now that that um, <laughs> they probably bombed it in the sense like they just bought probably some closed doors and went to the grocery store and got some uh, mm. anti-insecticide. Uh, uh, I would not do that, but probably they insecticide did. Insecticide bombs, yes. Probably the yeah. pilots would do that, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, that's a that's a terrible practical joke, but yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> oh, she came home one time, and the whole house was um, uh, covered in uh, cell phone. Uh, so no, it was uh, totally accurate. Oh right, so it was going over and back with the, yeah, the, yeah, pra- yeah, yeah, the practical yeah. jokes. Well, that, this, that was, uh, this was definitely defense. <laughs> oh, very good one. Very good one. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Ah, and in the field, um, uh, well, you you say you are uh, in in exotic places, Brazil, uh, the Caribbean. Um, what have you uh, encountered there that was uh, funny, dangerous, maybe uh, well, scary? It start, 
it started a little bit. Uh, I got actually a lab job for my postdoc, but when uh, for my uh, PhD. But during my interview, they asked me, "Would you mind going to Tanzania, Africa, oh. to do some field work?" Yeah, that was my reaction too. And uh, <laughs> I came from, I had never been with my family on travels. We were a farm family, so we would stay in house and uh, not in the area, not mm-hmm. go on flight holidays or to Spain. And I always had this really big urge, but till I was 18, I never traveled abroad. Okay. By that time, I had been twice or three times uh, with friends in Europe. But um, so when they asked me if I wanted to go to Africa, that was uh, when I applied for the job after my master's. I was like, oh, yeah. great. So, and only fair enough because you cannot get a PhD in malaria mosquitoes. I never have seen a real malaria mosquito, right? I yeah. thought I would just not be honored. That, that would be ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So they gave me the opportunity and I went to Tanzania. And that was, uh, I think I was, um, that was in 97, I think. Yeah. And um, I was uh, 25, 26. And... Uh, all by myself and that was uh, quite uh, interesting i only stayed there for two months but uh, in the two months i had uh first of all the the child of my supervisor passed away from malaria oh, oh. for pneumonia mm. for pneumonia oh, but he already lost a child of malaria mm. so this is an a educated person who even in africa cannot uh, manage to keep your uh, child uh, safe yeah. i thought that was quite a wake-up call uh because he was uh, he was a vet and mm-hmm. uh, he was a professional vet but worked in vector control yeah on vector uh, stuff so that was very intense i went to the funeral in uh, in an uh, intense and uh, that was uh obviously uh in, intense um uh thing and i i had to travel from that place with my electric nets in the bus to go uh, i think 700 kilometers to the other side of the country because he i was going to go with him i was going to pick him up and then yeah. we would travel together to mm-hmm. the southern part of Tanzania. okay obviously he could not do that because he had a morning period and and had to spend with his family sure. so uh, i had to go uh, to the other side of the uh, country uh, by bus train and uh, i arrived there and uh, people asked me, so, um, but it was in the middle of the night. I had been there two months before, but that was during daylight. And now I was like, I can go there. So I, I arrived there, pitch black, mm. train station. And uh, people came to me and it's like, uh, I said, who are you? I said, uh, uh, I'm uh, your doctor. And they, I thought I was picked oh. up. So I go into their car and I was brought to my colleague. I knock on his door. And he says, like, are you here? He had no idea that I I arrived. Okay. Uh, They were not his drivers. They were just random people that put two people together, and it happened to be okay. And I'm like, wow, great. So that was uh, was fantastic. Yeah. And then um, he applied for a job in Kenya. So we were going to the field, and I was there by myself with two Mm. Swahilian-speaking Tanzanians who I totally trusted, but not very communicative. No, I can imagine that's a problem. That, that that's a, a bit, but, and then uh, we were uh, catching mosquitoes with um, electric nets. Yes, you it's, mentioned them. How does that work? Just briefly. Well, it's like your mosquito. It's your fly catcher uh, right. that you have, and then they get electrocuted, and um, mm-hmm. it's a certain uh, voltage on it and amperage, and then they fall in soap under the thing, and then you collect it. Right. And we added some uh, odors that we got from myself, my tent, or other places, and see some difference if they mm. right. some olfaction uh, research. Uh, one time we found a bat in there who was going to uh, the mosquitoes attracted to the odors, but yeah. caught itself into the electnet, and then we got an it's very strange when you look for mosquitoes and then you look like, what is that? And then you focus out like, oh, it was this, and it was dead. It was uh, it electrocuted itself. Uh, that, that's, the, that's very sad. Yeah. So that's already sad. Yeah. But at one point we, we had to make these electric nets with uh, spark boxes and they make high, low voltage, high voltage, low amperage. Sure. Yes. Yeah. From, I had to think. Uh, so they are done on car batteries, but anything interesting they thought is valuable. So um, at one point, the spark boxes were stolen. Not oh no. the car batteries, but the spark box. Mm. You cannot get a. These were handmade by probably someone in marketing it to to do right. what they had to do. Mm-hmm. 
And then we suddenly got into the situation that you are there as a foreigner. The local government want to act appropriately. And uh, we were hosted. At, we were in tents in the beginning, but then we moved up to a little village. And then at night we heard some screams and we didn't know what it was. And then we found out that they were beating the shit out of local guys to find out where the park clubs came from. Where the, park, oh. where the spark box came from. So here you are, you you mentioned that something is stolen and they have their own way of getting the information back. And that feels wow. so extremely bad. But, but so, you mean really beating? I was not there. I just, yeah, yeah, I'm physically, yeah. 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 And they just rounded up the 18-year-old kids to figure mm -hmm. out if they knew something yeah, right. horrible so and i was 25 like oh i don't want this i'm a member of amnesty and this is like oh no it's very uh -huh. very uncomfortable and then the next day suddenly a spark box appears on the side of the road completely covered with mud and sand so okay it's probably hidden in the ground somewhere mm. and <laughs> did it still work yep yeah. so Despite not having your supervisor uh, there and, and you got your equipment back, so you were able to finish your research. Yeah, but on a very uh, unpleasant way. I, I'm not sure mm. at that point whether they were there, but that was at the time that a lot of these things happened. One was gone, one had to come. And uh, so my supervisor from the north, he had, um, we didn't know if he was coming. It was before cell phones. Mm -hmm. We had faxes. <laughs> yeah. It feels like I'm grandma now. But uh, so it was not so easy to communicate. And after a few days or maybe weeks, he suddenly arrived in his land rover on the other side of the country and he just joined us. So oh, at the end, oh, we were, were all together uh -huh. and we had a very good time. And uh, um, but we also that was uh, in a small village. We had to put bed nets up. We did some experiments also with bed nets and catching mosquitoes. And then mm -hmm. um, another story was that. Um, we visited person and he was very apprehensive to let us in, but we selected that house. So we were persistent and things like uh -huh. that. And then, then we found this lady in the back of this hut and uh, all covered by, um, uh, uh, she was well covered. And then we found later on that uh, it was someone's daughter who had had uh, epileptic uh, attack, but she had was was carrying hot water and she had burned herself. Oh dear! Yeah, and uh, it was months ago, and uh, parents had given her to someone who was going to proffer to witchcraft her uh, oh. to cure her, and it was an old man who was now living with this young lady. All kind of like oh yeah, that's quite a. Uh... Quite a shift from the Netherlands, huh? Yeah, so you come there and uh, luckily I was not responsible for this whole thing. We had a local, yeah. someone from Tanzania, and there's a lot of probably talk about this that I don't know of. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember this was my field, my first real field experience that, that was quite intense. A, yeah. Quite a culture shock. Yes. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say. The 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 the, the field work has very often nothing to do with the topic you're investigating. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's that's the uh, despite your best attempts to to plan everything, things happen all the time, right? Yes, yeah. especially with people. Yeah, yeah, these are probably not the 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 best. These are not the nicest experiences. Why you like field work, but it is definitely the 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 the. The only way you experience these things, and you never know what happens. So you mm -hmm. have to be a little bit um, adaptive, flexible, and uh, and and try to uh, get out, mm -hmm. get out it without too much harming anyone or yourself. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I I never felt really afraid there, but in hindsight, when you come back home and then you tell like, oh yeah, this happened. And yeah. Like, oh, that was, that was weird. <laughs> so usually, it's, uh, in hindsight. So that's in the context of being there. It it doesn't seem so extreme as then when you come back. Yeah, that's that's it's, interesting. It's usually the it? case. Yeah, or for me at least, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it feels. Uh, I think it's it's the if you're good in field work, the, you do what you have to do and you get out of it. Mm -hmm. You are innovative. Uh, I'm very much not so good in being in the desk and doing policy, but mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely have a lot of things I'm not so good at. But uh, I found now I'm nearly 54. I think I'm very good in that. In <laughs> in in 
in taking it in, find a solution and uh, try not to put yourself in danger too much and just yeah. uh, get with the people and, and figure it out and always think that you're winning. <laughs> and now you take students into the field to share that experience, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have actually uh, uh, come back what I work, I do now. Uh, most of my students, they uh, go, I've sent three or four groups to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was an urban setting and it's not the most, it's definitely not sending people to Tanzania, but uh, there's uh, um, quite some history between the Caribbean and the Netherlands. So it gives other challenges and, and uh, yeah. it definitely needs some adaptation from the student side. I'm sure. I mean, these are all young students. It's always a culture shock, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I uh, very often, I uh, that's a good, I, I found out a useful advice. I gave it last week also to someone who's going to Aruba. It's like, um, I asked them what they're going to do. And mm -hmm. Dutch student says like, well, I arrive on Wednesday, uh, five o'clock at night. I take a good sleep and then eight o'clock I will be at the department and then uh, I'm going to give them the agenda and uh, figure out the right. schedule. And I said, I go, hold your horses. You're not going to do anything this week anymore. <laughs> You're going to arrive and figure out where you are and spend Thursday, Friday and the weekend to figure out where you are. Maybe say hi, but leave your efficiency, the Dutch mm. efficiency behind <laughs> and then on Monday, you make an appointment. When on Monday, it will feeds, and then you right. are in the right set, and you're not a time lag anymore. And uh, I got students back who said, like, it was very hard not to do anything the first three days, but it gained at the end mm. uh, so much. Yep. Um, you have to get because... into the speed of the, the locale. Yeah. Yeah, and they are so used to what we call efficient, what is very, uh, well, it's probably the fittest, right? It's very fit for mm -hmm. the Netherlands. Yes. Very unfit for many other places. It's not that they are slow or anything. It's just very different. And you yeah. have to figure out what the fit way to do. So mm -hmm. uh, I, <laughs> I usually ask the, them to do that. Right. <laughs> and, and um, I mean, the uh, we talked about the snake people before and i'm a scorpion guy but uh i i have i you know dozens of my favorite species of scorpions but um do you have any favorite mosquitoes or doesn't it work like that in mosquito world um no I think I'm actually an anthropologist that uses mm. mosquitoes to get everywhere. No, I actually on my uh, my WhatsApp I have a picture of uh, Sabete Siena Sienese. I see mm -hmm. I'm not even uh, can pronounce it right, but it's the most beautiful mosquito in the world, which has uh, purple blue flags on their uh, uh, legs. Oh, so it's yeah, I've a seen very those. beautiful. Uh, it's a it's a forest. It's an American forest uh, mosquito, and uh, I actually never saw it a lot in real life, but it's definitely a beautiful uh, mosquito. Uh, we recently had a project with someone in Sweden who actually can make pictures of live mosquitoes mm -hmm. because um, I think a lot of people that work with beetles think they're so pretty that they have a whole history in having all catalogs of pretty beetles or butterflies. But yeah. mosquitoes are horrendously ugly dead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so collections are things break off. Uh, mm. it, it, so you cannot pin them. It's it's uh, you keep them fresh. So I have of course some taxonomy friends who teach taxonomy. So they have to renew their collection the whole time because otherwise you cannot see the. the so it's yeah, yeah. I'm not into that labor at all. Um, I of course appreciate that all mosquitoes are species are different and doing different things. That's mm -hmm. my job, but I'm not so good in the taxonomy. But um, yeah, I, I, I did work with um, Aedes mosquitoes, with Anopheles mosquitoes, with mm -hmm. Culex mosquitoes. So I did my fair range, uh, but usually only because they transmit diseases. What is yeah. an ugly trait of yeah. them, obviously. Well, they can't help it. Does it make them sick? I mean, uh, the first person... First creature to get sick, I imagine, is the mosquito, right? Uh, it's a trade-off. If they get uh, in in infectious diseases, it's always an end. Uh, we all know what an R not is, right? Since uh, since um, uh, Corona, 
you have to be efficient to spread to, yeah. to that you give something to more than one other individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything that doesn't do that dies out. So there's probably a lot of very inefficient viruses that attack the mosquitoes that never survived. Yeah. So the ones that we have now, obviously, I've never tested. And there's some research on putting a lot of malaria parasites in uh, mosquitoes, and they do suffer from it. Okay. But in the natural range, mm -hmm. there's a trade-off mm -hmm. because, especially, the mosquito still has to fly. Yes. To be helping the virus. And of course, it's not consciously, it's how evolution works, but all the viruses that get into a mosquito that kills it or being less efficient or yeah. whatever has not very efficient. So over the, the evolution, there's a relationship between certain viruses and certain mosquito species. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why um, AIDS is not transmitted or uh, by mosquitoes or malaria is only transmitted by Anopheles and not by Aedes mosquitoes mm -hmm. because although they're all mosquitoes and a very narrow family of 3,500 yeah. worldwide, apparently um, you have to realize that the mosquito doesn't want it, right? <laughs> they're I, not the no. mailman. They're not paid for it. Nope. So they try not to carry them. Mm -hmm. But the pathogen escaped mm. the defense mechanism. Right. So it's not actually, I like to, uh, instead of calling it vector competence, this is the competence of a vector to transmit a pathogen. Yes. Is it a vector, is it a, a, a defense failure? Mm. It's a very different way of looking at, um, so the malaria parasites have find a error in the mm. Anopheles mosquito. Yes. What is not too big for the Anopheles to not survive anymore, but can yeah. uh, carry it around. Nobody wants to be the carrier of pathogens. It's it's not in their... Uh, no, um, I, 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 for one thing, it would endanger their, their uh, host species, right? I mean, if all the yeah. people die out, mosquitoes have nothing to eat. So they don't no. really want to transmit, I imagine. But usually uh, <laughs> things are not so black and white. So the chance that the whole... Uh, mm. So that's, uh, well, good point. Um, obviously, the longevity of humans are uh, still not selected in that part. It's too long. So mm. it would not have an uh, evolutionary trait uh, on the mosquito parasite relationship. It has to be a backfiring thing, of course. But if you're yeah. still around, that, that will not backfire. Yeah. But it is definitely intricate between the vector and the uh, and and the host. <laughs> right, right. And uh, the famous story is about uh, uh, worms, the the um, Ugeria bancrofti that only it's it's a, a small um, uh, a worm. Okay, where you get elephantiasis from. Oh people with yes, big legs and yes. uh, quite a horrible disfiguring disease. Yeah. Also, a very interesting Tanzania story on it. I will finish. Oh, the, oh please. <laughs> so the the these uh, filarial worms they are only in the blood when the mosquito is active. Mm. So they come in the blood when it's crepuscular. So it's in the in the the transition from light to dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they also have other things to do in your body, but then it's uh, selected for for the night active. And worms because they can be picked up when the mosquito is blood feeding. Wow. So there's a lot of intricate adaptations or evo uh, evolution between the that, these interactions. That's amazing. So they come to the surface kind of to be uh, picked up by mosquitoes. Yeah, in your, in your periphery, actually yeah. in the blood. They go from the, yeah. the your 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 uh, tissues yeah. into the blood and in your bloodstream. Wow. Yeah, when we were in Tanzania, we were yeah. actually going to a place to put the, uh, the, uh, that was, so we put electric traps next to someone's home. Yes. We were talking to the person. My colleague was back from the funeral. They were talking to each other. And I found out that this was a very small, uh, man who had a very big skirt on, a very, ah. like, a, like a, a thick cloth. And, uh, uh, it's not a, Muslim area, so mm -hmm. guys wearing skirts, what you sometimes see in Indonesia or other things. It was not a cultural thing for uh, males to wear skirts. Right. And so uh, I asked my colleague, and I said, what happened? Oh, the man has um, elephantiasis in his testicles. Oh. Yeah. 
So I was culturally well aware that I should not mention it to the man as a white woman investigating, yeah. asking whatever. You, you don't want to say, can I see it? That, that's no, it. <laughs> no, obviously not, but also not the story on it. But uh, we had been, um, since you cannot save the world, there is a little bit a, a how we call it, a um, custom to take care of the people when you're there. So if you work at people's home and you mm-hmm. see an illness or you can help something out, there is an ability to to do that, not to take care because you're gone in two weeks, but that's a little bit the favor you can give to someone. Sure. So uh, I asked him what to help it. And uh, anyway, long story short, we took him to the capital and he has been uh, um, in surgery and uh, he was still in surgery or waiting for surgery when I left the country. But I found out that he has been... Uh, we paid for his uh, surgery, and uh, oh, wow. he had been uh, um, eleven fantastic. years with this. Yeah, that's fantastic. But we went to the hospital with him, and I will never forget that the nurse asked him to sit on a in a stool on a stool. Mm-hmm. But the weight of uh, his disease would just push. The, the the stool away till he would put it to the back wall so oh. he could sit on it. Wow. And these were this big. Yeah. And uh, that was already yeah. 11 years and that was uh, caused by elephantiasis where it's a worm that is uh, clogging, I think, the lymphatic system. Mm-hmm. And then you get a kind of an autoimmune. Don't, I'm not a med, med, but there's something that uh, Udim mm-hmm. um, yeah. collects where this is, uh, and that happens to be legs in India, and it happens to be uh, uh, on the different parts of your body in uh, in Africa. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. How that uh, uh, how that goes? Maybe it's a different uh, flower worm, maybe a different mosquito. It's it's. A, uh, but we helped him. But uh, um, it's amazing. Yeah, that someone uh, it doesn't cure itself. What a life! I I so he was able to sit down, but barely i i think yeah. yeah and then you have those jokes you have land rover he's in the middle and i ask him to sit away a little bit from my uh, rear uh, mirror but he had to sit that wide yeah. yeah on the bench because there's so i mean i'm not a man but i can imagine that is um uh not good no just <laughs> the amount of mass pulling on that fairly small part of the body is yeah is... i know that i don't have yeah. to explain to any other <laughs> person that that a uh, guy that that is something you don't want and he had that since his last daughter was born mm. and his daughter was 11 years wow i actually have seen a person with the same affliction uh on a bus in germany <laughs> and and all the seats were full and people were standing and it was an empty seat and we were wondering okay why is that seat empty and then we sat down and then we saw that the guy sitting across from us had a gigantic Something. Testicle, but something between his legs. Uh, yeah, that must have been elephantitis. I, uh, I imagine that's, that's it, yeah. It's not a good I, look. I had to bring. We 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 brought him to the hospital and we were guiding it. And then I think it was like a few tens of dollars. It was really not a, a oh. amount for us to uh, pay it. So yeah. uh, and then I walked around with the form, and it was written because Tanzania is uh, they ha- they speak Swahili, but it is in English the medical uh, terms. Sure, extremely huge balls was on it, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a extremely huge test because I will uh, uh, refrain from it. But it was yeah, it was very. <laughs> it, it's not it's not very common. It's 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 it, to become that big. So it was uh, uh, yeah. I had my fair share of poor. Um, Tanzania mm. then, because it's definitely a poor man's disease. You can get yeah. probably anti-worm treatment and in an earlier stage, and it uh, probably mm. would have been resolved. Uh, he has, of course, no active worms anymore, so this has to be different. I mean, the, this is a, a secondary effect mm. of an early infection. I see. But that doesn't... Um, so it's, it's a secondary effect. So he, even when he doesn't have worms anymore... This is not going to go away, and it it, it 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 happens more often because I think he had been treated, but mm-hmm. treated mm-hmm. for the worm infection, not for yeah. the consequence that came from. Okay, well, it must be a nice feeling to be able to do something back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That was it was uh, was uh, very nice. Also, very uh, topic, very 
Uh, yeah. So, so you're 25, you're in a strange country, then you uh, bump into this. It's, uh, yeah, you have to kind of. <laughs> you have to do uh, deal with what uh, what lies in front of you. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and it's a really nice story that you were able to, to give something back to, uh, to, to the people that you were, that were helping your research, in fact, right? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Marietta, it's it's been uh, almost an hour, I think. So yeah, uh, I'm let's, sorry. Let's yeah. uh, no, I I could uh, listen to your stories for much longer, but uh, maybe we should do that another time. That's fine. If you're up for it, if you have more stories, I I would love to hear them. It's very interesting for me. It's uh, uh mosquitoes and and medical things are a bit of an exotic field because I'm usually <laughs> hanging around with uh, bearded uh, herpetologists and and people like that. <laughs> See, that's one hint back to Roux as a young bearded uh, herpetologist. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, so yeah, is vector uh, biology is uh, is uh, besides being kind of having a purpose. We don't have to do anything about valorization. It's uh, much more easier to uh, write yes. plants, but it is uh, also uh, really uh, hurting uh, people sometimes. So we do it for a purpose, and uh, and these are just one of those uh, stories. So it's um, yeah. Um, it's, as as uh, Rul said, it's probably much more to do with people. And I mentioned, I started it saying that I really was not so interested in people. So full circle, actually, <laughs> I do vectors and I, uh, it has to do with animal and uh, human health. So it's uh, funny Tur how worlds uh Turns out people are the interesting ones. Yeah. I sometimes I want to get away with it and then we really do full work <laughs> out in the, uh, in the end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Marietta, um, and uh, hopefully see you again sometime soon. All right. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Bye.